Welcome to Guests and Gusto, SCAD's virtual series of conversations and digital content with the creators and innovators remaking culture. I'm Scott Allen Smith, Professor of Performing Arts. I'm so happy to introduce our guest today, Greg Lindberg. Um, you have seen Greg in such films as Star Wars. He plays Snap Wexley, Star Trek Beyond, A Star is Born, alongside Al Pacino and Barry Levinson's Paterno. Currently, he stars alongside Kevin Smith in the cult classic Max Reload and the Nether Blasters as well as the much beloved Big Ass Spider. He's also a podcaster <laughs> and co-wrote the graphic novel series Dream Jumper for Spastic. Make sure to follow him on Greg uh, Grunberg uh, on Instagram. We also are joined today by our moderator, Frank Radis. Frank is a multiple Emmy winning journalist, producer, director, musician, author, media marketing executive. He is the managing partner of the consulting firm Vita FR Company in New York City and London, and the expert in residence Vixen Labs in the UK. He's on the advisory boards of SCAD Savannah Film Festival, Digital Hollywood, the Broadway Walk of Stars, and Observatory Pictures. Frank's the former president and CMO of the National Academy of Television Arts and Sciences, those are the Emmy Awards, EVP of the NBC Agency, the former chair of the Promax BDA UK Conference and Awards, and consultant to Univision Communications and the El Ray Network. <laughs> After the conversation, we'll have a brief uh, moment to ask Greg a few questions. So please have them ready to go in the chat room. That's where I'll be pulling them from. And now we are ready to begin. Welcome to Frank and Greg. What's up? Hey guys. That's enough. We're done. Thank you very much. It's been yeah. Great. No, no. Let that. Let the applause <laughs> keep going. Right. There you go. There you go. <laughs> Thank you, Cat. Uh, so you know, look, I, I could start this whole thing out with. So how did you start? Uh, but I'm not going to do that because I think if people want to hear about that, you can ask that question later on. I want to dive right in uh, to stuff that I think is going to be salient to the students. Um, like, uh, first of all, one of the things you and I talked about, Greg, was the difference between the difference in the way that you approach uh, uh, a, an audition. Mm -hmm. uh, how, how does that work for you? And what is that in terms of the way you might have thought it was before you created your own style? Uh, oh, I mean, there's, that's, there's a lot to that question. Um, but as far as, um, let, look, there, let me just start off by saying, and everybody knows this, there is so much rejection in our business and you can't look at it like that. You can't look at it in a negative sense. You have to look at opportunities, good, bad, indifferent, whatever they are, those opportunities are a chance for you to create, to express yourself, to do what you love to do. I love to act. So auditions, whether they're voiceover auditions, on-camera auditions, self-tape auditions, whatever it is, it's a chance for me to act. So, um, you know, even if I know it's not going well, even if I know I'm not perfect for the role, now it's very different. Now I get offered things and I go and have meetings with people virtually or not or whatever, but still I have to read for big films and things. And I, I get so excited when I have an audition because you know, I can, I can read all I want, but or I can call up a friend and we can go over, an, you know, a scene together and, and do it. But to be able to go, you know, have the opportunity to act. I always say, I'm like, I get to act today. That's huge. You can't, you know, as a writer, I can sit down and write, but then you always, or you're just craving that reaction. You're craving, you know, um, uh, you just, I love becoming other people. I love doing that. So for me to be able to, even if it's for one scene, two scenes, three scenes, whatever it is, um, you know, I, I I just love it. So the process, the roller coaster, the ups and the downs, I enjoy all of it. It's it's tough with you know uh, at the beginning when we started out, it was tough on on you know my wife and and it, there's the whole auditions too. Don't talk about auditions with people outside of the business. If you mention the audition to somebody inevitably five days later, they're going to go, Hey, how'd it go? <laughs> it's like, you just don't want to have to answer that question. It's like, uh, just do it and move on and, and know that if um, and, there's so many things to it, I could break down the audition too. If well, I, one of the, one of the things that I wanted to ask you specifically about, and, and don't, don't, if you feel uncomfortable give, divulging your secrets, just let me know. No, but the way that you approach, we talked about this, the way that you approach an audition, you know, what, what you expect them to expect from you almost seems like you go in the opposite direction. You sort of zig when other people might zag, so to speak. Yeah, I mean, I uh, look, there's only one you, okay? And uh, I'm talking to the actors that are on right now. 
there there's only one you and if and regardless of what it says on the breakdown regardless of it says of the character you're going to bring you know the look and the the personality your reactions the the how you would um you know uh, uh occupy this character and become this character so if you go into a room and they're not getting it or whatever fine who cares just this is what you bring you're unique and when they catch up to you you're 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 going to be unstoppable so i you know I, I when i go into an audition i i don't kiss ass i just i walk in i'm friendly with everybody never shake anybody's hand that's just just i mean literally walking in going hi how are you how are you nice to meet you it just it's it reeks of desperation and by the way i'm as desperate as anybody else like we all want these jobs some of these jobs will change your life i mean one of my jobs that frank and i worked on together literally changed my career even though i had done some big things before it was heroes that just all of a sudden just you know exploded all over the world so you have that potential with every you know that that's the carrot that's hang hanging over all of us in this business is all you want to do is just work you want to have a you know a, a career where it just keeps going and one audition can change that one audition but you can't you can't let that show you can't wear that into the room so i do that and when I started out, I was, I was auditioning for commercials. Commercials, they see 500 people for the same role of a guy standing there taking a sip of beer and going, that's good. So everybody says the same line. It's all written the same way. Take a sip. Ah, that's good. And I know that, uh, you know, you guys, you, that's not what your career goal is to be on a commercial where you're sipping beer, but it all starts somewhere, right? So I would do that, do that. I didn't get a call back for a year. One year, my agent was well, was ready to drop me because um, she was like, that's just not working out. I don't know. She calls me um, and leaves a message. I call her. We're playing phone tag. In the process of playing phone tag, there was an audition that I had for Michelob Golden Draft. And um, I went in and for the, for the initial call, but for the initial audition, I remember thinking, you know what? I'm going to do something different. I'm just, I, I have to do something. I have to stand out. Even though it's, I'm different than everybody else, I'm still that fraternity kind of best friend kind of guy. So I started cursing in these auditions. And I would take a sip of the beer and I go, that's fucking good beer. And the, guy, and, the, and the casting agent would go, what are you doing? You can't, no, 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 it's a commercial. And I'm like, that's okay. And they say, no, do it again. I'm like, nope, that's my audition. And they would keep it on the tape. They'd be going through the tape and they'd get to me and go, who's this guy? What is he, like the balls on this guy. And then I would go back well, for the callback. I'm what? sorry. Uh, okay, that sounds to me like you're saying uh, that you you shouldn't go in there and try and expect to give the presentation to the director what you think the director wants. Um. Well. Okay. So what a director wants to see, without question, is your unique take. So you go in and you do it the way you want to do it. Okay, let me finish real quick. There's just the, that, that other story. So I, 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 she calls me back in the process of that phone tag. I ended up getting seven national commercials for Michelob Golden Draft and being the guy. And, and so it was, it, and it was, it all started that way. But when you go in at now as a director, what I want to see from people is I want to see, first of all, get that page. You can hold your sides, but do not read the sides in an audition. You want the job, learn the lines. Okay learn the lines. You can refer to them. You can write in the margins, big words that will remind you of what that little, you know, uh, um, monologue, not monologue, but the little sentences are, whatever. That's what I do just so you can have it as a point of reference, but don't, you know, when you watch actors on screen, when they're, when they're locked, and this is why a lot of some actors in really intense moments when there's close up on them or whatever, they don't blink. And as soon as they blink, it, it, the audience is taken out of the scene, or as soon as their eyes drop, you drop. You know, you want them to lean in. So in an audition, the more you, as soon as you drop down and look at the thing, and then you come back, they're in and out of the scene, man. You, you want to know it. If you really are taking this seriously, know your stuff and you'll get better at it and better at it. But um, so the, the director though, like me, I want to see your take. I want to see, oh, wow. It's a collaborative process we're in, guys. Everybody adds to the process. I mean, I'm, you know, from, from working with J.J. Abrams, my best friend in the world in Star Wars, even Star Wars, he's taking advice. He's, he's like, you know, oh, that's a good idea. You know, I, I, we would sit and go over stuff. So in an audition, bring what you, what you have in your head, 
the casting associate might not read it at the same pace, might not be reacting at all, may give you nothing. Do your thing. The director then wants to give you notes and you then, on the second take, adjust to what they ask you to do. So if you do it that first way and then they go, eh, he's, too, he's just too big next to our co-star. There's so many elements that take you out of it. But if you give them something, they're gonna be like, oh, that was really cool. Okay, can you just do it a little bit lighthearted, not so mean, not so this and that. Then you do it their way. But take the opportunity to give them something that they may not have just seen from the person that was just in the room before you. It's just important. So um, it's funny, I was actually going to uh, put on the brakes and make a hard left, but I'm not going to do that because you brought up something I think that's worth following up. And that is um, your friends with JJ uh, Abrams. Uh, you, you, you do work with Kevin Smith. I clearly, uh, you have a, a group of people around you that you know and whom, tr whom you trust and, and they trust you. Uh, to be able to, as an actor, uh, suggest that maybe we should try doing this or that or the other thing. How, how much of that actually happens uh, in today's real world? Wait, re, re, uh, well, that, that you can make a suggestion on how a scene oh. might play to the director. How much of that, because you have such great relationship with these yeah. guys, how much yeah. of that really happens? Well, usually? okay. So that, that does vary. Um, I, I have a really funny story. Way back, I did a, a show called NYPD Blue and uh, David Milch, one of the writers on NYPD Blue, and they used, to, they used to call it getting milched. Actors would call it getting milched. You learn your lines and he was, he's such a great writer, so prolific. Uh, Deadwood, all these great shows. Anyway, he would, um, he would write, uh, this monologue would show up as you're walking to set. You're, you're in the makeup trailer, you know your stuff. You're like, all right, we're gonna block this. You go block it, then you go get makeup and then you're getting the wardrobe on and all of a sudden knock at the door and they're like, oh, David has new pages. And it would be, I'm not kidding you, a monologue and word for word, you do not change a David Milch line. You just don't. And because and, and, it's poetry. Anyway, very famous actor is uh, gets to set. And a lot of actors, they if they don't know their stuff, they just get lazy and they add a bunch of, uh, you, uh, you could see it in their performance. And, um, and this actor just was not, he was just not saying it the way it was written. And so they called David down. He was like, you know what? I just, it's, they called David down from the offices. He came down, he went to set and he goes, he goes, what's the problem? And the actor was like, I, I just, my character just wouldn't say these lines. This is what he says to the, to, to, to the writer. And so David Milch goes, let me see. And he looks at the sides. I mean, this is a script, but he looks at the sides. And he looks at it and he goes, oh yeah, he would. Yeah, it's right there. Yeah, he would say those lines. <laughs> okay, so there are certain people that no matter what, they want those words exactly. Then there are other, and by the way, usually again, is the second take. It'll be like, all right, so let's just get it the way it's written. That's the way I direct. I'm like, let's just get it as written and then throw it out the window. Just give me that same message. You know, get the emotion of the scene, get me through this scene. You know where we have to go. At the end, you're gonna tell this person that you're gay. You're going to tell this person that you're not going to be in business with them anymore. You're going to tell her you love her. Whatever the outcome of that scene is, let's get there. But let's let's have some play with the words and, and, and react. And sometimes that's gold. You know, that's the best way to do it, especially when I work with kids. I mean, little kids, they they have this sort of Disney way of acting and they learn their lines. And that's it. I did a movie called Tiger's Tale. And I remember the lead actor. He played my son. And we're. He said to me, he goes, yeah, my, my acting coach told me um, to not listen to you when you, act, when you come up with suggestions on set, just do what we did last night. And I said, I said, listen, uh, and he, this kid's 12, but he's a good, he was a decent actor. He was carrying the movie. I said, first of all, fire that teacher, unless it's your dad. And, um, and, and you have to listen, like you have to react. Acting is not acting. If, if I see you acting in something, you're a terrible actor. I need to see you reacting. You need to be that person. You need to react, not act. <laughs> acting, if, if you're acting shows, then it's like, oh, just like posing or, you know, saying your line, waiting for their line, saying your line. No, cut them off. If, if you see yourself as that character in the scene and, and that person's rambling, in real life, you would cut them off. You, you know, we don't finish our sentences. We, you know, anyway, there, that's a whole other you know, that's, getting... that's a lot. That's a lot like doing an interview and reading the questions and not listening to the answers so that you can follow up on them. I'm sorry, Jay Leno. 
<laughs> you think? So <laughs> let me let now I'm gonna I'm I'm not gonna put on the brakes full force and make that hard left turn, but I do want to yeah. talk a little bit about the fact that you you're you're a multi-talented guy. You're a writer, a producer, a director. Uh, you 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 are a businessman. You, you even had your own frozen yogurt company when you were a kid, and you know you you do all of these things. And and on top of that, you're a terrific drummer. Greg and I actually made a record together with Hugh Laurie and his band, uh, Band from TV. Get it? Band from TV. Yeah. Uh, and uh, David Foster produced it, so we had a chance to actually sort of one on one work together on something, which was really cool. Uh, but you do all of these things. How important is it to be multi-talented in today's environment uh, in the entertainment business? Uh, you know, um, it's a, that's a loaded question because if I, you know, if I was in the situation that all of you are in right now, I would say focus, focus, focus. Focus is the key. Um, I started, I had the first mobile coupon app. I created an app. That's a tech thing. I love, I'm very entrepreneurial, but that has nothing to do with being creative in the business or, or in, in my business. And, and JJ of all people, you know, my, who's my, literally like my, my brother. I mean, we've known each other since we were five. He, we had a talk one day where, where I, where I, I had sold my, you know, the, the, the app and he was like, just try to focus like everything you're doing. Yeah. Look, if you're, if you want to be entrepreneurial, start directing commercials and, you know, but everything should be in that creative tunnel. And so I'm trying to narrow my focus. Um, but it is important coming up right now. Like you should know every aspect of our business. You should know it all. No one knows more than Frank. You've been on both sides. You're, you're continuing to be on you know, both sides from, from marketing, marketing is just as important. You know, uh, when you're writing a script, you better be able to pitch this in your head, the way a trailer, like if, if, if you can't pitch me what this movie is as an actor, I'm reading this script. If I don't see, if I don't see lines or moments where I go, Oh, that's a trailer moment. Then what, what are we doing? Why are we, why are you making this movie? You know what I mean? I, I have a, a script right now that I'm developing and the so what is the question that I always approach every project. If a script is sent to me, there's a question in the chat that says, what, what do you, how do you, you know, what gravitates you towards a project? And I, if, I, if I'm asking myself, so what, while I'm reading this, like, what are the stakes? I created a show a while ago um, that I sold to uh, Shonda Rhimes and we made a pilot, uh, Scott Foley and I from F Felicity Days um, did it together. And it was, I'm, I'm sitting at a wedding, right? And every wedding I go to and the, the rehearsal dinner or the, you know, the toasts. Toasts, if you get up and you give a bullshit toast, a general toast, like, hey, it was really great knowing you. This was awesome. You guys are the best. Do you remember that toast? No, never. You don't even remember that person, that toast, whatever. These are seminal moments. You give up, you get up and give a toast. It is the most important moment that you remember in that person's life. Well, guess what? That's also a TV show idea. That's also an episode of a TV show. That's also a movie. If this isn't a seminal moment, Felicity, here's a girl who she made the choice to go follow a guy to New York instead of following what her dad wanted her to do. This is a, a moment she'll always talk about, like, man, when I made that choice in my life. And that's interesting enough to fuel a show. Um, Star Wars for, certainly is, is filled with all that stuff, but even comedies, the situation that you put that in, that's a moment that you would talk about forever. And if it's not, there are great character stuff. Don't get me wrong, there's great moments, but it's always a moment that shifted that character that, that where you could say, man, your life was never the same after that, even if it's a small thing. So, um, you know, that, that, I don't know, I don't even remember your original question. Frank, it doesn't matter. Uh, because I loved how you, you, you sort of shifted us over into that marketing thing, because, you know, think about the amount of money that a budget, uh, is, is attached to the marketing part of a film. It's, it's extraordinarily large. Uh, and I, I can say that I, I actually found myself in, uh, in, on occasion talking to some of the actors in, uh, uh, certainly the directors, but the actors in the, in the various programs that we were marketing who would say, you got to hear this line. This is really good. Make sure you find that. It, was, it, was, it is really an important thing, uh, people, what Greg's talking about. If you, if you can take 
Imagine how many great movies are out there that also had great trailers, but imagine how many great trailers were made for really bad movies and you still went and saw the movie because the trailers were so good. I'm going to ask you a quick question about, you did three Star Wars movies, I think, three of them? Two. Two. Um, uh, two. Yeah, The Force Force Awakens and The Rise of Skywalker, yeah. But didn't didn't you actually not get to the set on one of those films and there was some kind of wacky way that they made you get into the movie? I read Uh a story about... Uh, about no, no that's uh, star how... trek star trek oh, that was the star trek movie right right yeah yeah, yeah. so jj was i knew it it was one of the star movies because you had star wars star trek and a star is born and i recognize <laughs> exactly. that there's a there's a pattern there uh but in the star trek movie tell us that story it's kind of interesting yeah so star trek so jj was doing star trek and he you know he's i'm his first call he's like all right so here's what i'm thinking and i'm because i always go congratulations what am i playing who am i in this movie? i mean like you know you have to hustle man don't be afraid actors out there writers directors producers don't be afraid to call on your friends this is a this is an industry of friends you are not being a pain in the ass trust me you want to call your friends and go man congratulations i would love to do this if there's anything i'm right for please let me know whatever you're not you're not doing anything that you shouldn't be doing you're doing what you should be doing so don't be afraid to do that i'm the king of that i always go hey congratulations what am I playing? Who am I playing? And it puts them, it puts you in the back of their mind. And they're like, oh, you know what? The, yeah, the, the cop. I never even thought that you'd be great for that role. It's just, it's, it's all about networking. Um, just because there are so many of us that want to work and, um, you know, just putting yourself in top of mind in their, in their heads. Um, but beyond, uh, so, so uh, the first movie, not even beyond, uh, Star Trek Beyond, but uh, the first movie. So JJ is doing it and he goes, all right, I want you to be a red shirt. People know who you are. And if you show up as a red shirt in a Star Trek movie, they know you're going to die. And so there was this scene where these they were they were diving down to this landing area and there's this big fight and this whole thing. And Olsen is this guy and he's like, let's go kick some Romulan ass. And he's like, this guy was overly excited and they dive down and he dies. Well, I that was how I was supposed to do that. Well, at the same time, I had written produced and I was starring in a movie called Group Sex, a romantic comedy set in the world of a sexaholic recovery group. Um, And uh, Frank, you know, uh, Larry Trilling, Lawrence Trilling. Larry and I wrote the movie together. He was directing it. We, it's all, it was an independent movie. It's so funny. I got so many great people in it. It's not a sexual movie. It's just, it's all about 12 step program. And a guy follows a girl into a 12 step meeting and he realizes you know, and she's a sexaholic and let's say, what do I do? Anyway, I'm the roommate. And I, anyway, it's a really fun movie, but I had locked days. I had locked things. And of course, when it rains, it pours. I hadn't worked in a big project in six months. And JJ's like, all right, we have your days. We want you to, and I was shooting my own movie. So I couldn't be in the movie in Star Trek, Star Trek. And so JJ's like, don't worry. And I'm like, oh, I know, but I want to be that guy. So there was, there was then um, another scene where a young Star, a young Kirk is driving his dad's Corvette. And by the way, JJ calls me his lucky charm. That's how, that's how, how much friends want to work with friends. And he's the sweetest guy in the world. Not bad to be JJ's, JJ Abrams' lucky charm. Um, the, knowing JJ, having that in with someone like that, everybody says, God, that's amazing. No, what's amazing is my friendship with him. He is the greatest person ever. This, all this other stuff is icing on the cake. I just want to say that uh, right, right now, but doesn't yes it doesn't hurt but anyway he goes so 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 young kirk is driving this car you guys know the movie you'll you'll know and he's driving and it's sort of this thelma louise moment where the car is go, goes off a cliff and just as he's driving it you hear his stepdad on the speakerphone going i swear to god if you touch that car i you're you're punished buddy you're and that was me so i played kirk's evil stepdad and i play uh, you know my my role of uh, cap of commander finnegan in beyond and it was nice to be able to do a voiceover thing and then not having shown my face i was able to still be another character in the in a different so i'm in two different star trek movies you know which is great so you you actually uh pivoted into one of the things i was going to ask you about now i don't have to ask you about it which is the importance of the connections the friendships and the uh and that and how important that is to somebody uh, you've answered that so i'm going to move on to something else but, I, but I'll, um, I'll say one thing though about that is um you know, we are, everybody's multi-hyphenate. You guys are going to be multi-hyphenate. You're starting out, I'm talking to the actors here, uh, or even writers, you're going to write something and then you're going to go, I just want to see it on its feet and you're going to shoot it. 
And then you're going to go, oh, I really like acting. And oh, so you might put yourself in some things. Maybe not. I mean, a lot of writers don't. But actors, we, you have to create your own content. You, ha- you can't sit around waiting for the phone to ring. You have to. And by the way, no one's going to. Can you tell I'm passionate about this? No one is going to hire you unless you've already been hired. It's just the way it is. No one wants to take a chance on you. So why don't you take the chance on you? What are you waiting for? This is the best camera around, the the, the iPhone. It's like, it's better than cameras that I use, the Red Epic and all these great cameras. You can, it's 4K and you don't even need 4K and and the the streaming stuff. So get a scene, do a scene, you know, shoot it or whatever. Now, all of a sudden you've done something, you hired you. And I know that sounds ridiculous, but then when you go to, to audition for something, they go, oh, well, he's already done that and that and that. Who cares if they're your, your projects? You've already done it. Someone's already hired you. It was you, but that doesn't matter. You can't, it's all of, when I was starting, I needed tape. How did I get tape? I needed a job to get tape. You know, I needed, there wasn't a phone. I didn't have a cell phone. This is a hundred years ago. So um, I would, I was really at the mercy of other people. So I would go around to student film, I would, SC and UCLA film school. I would give my headshot in their little book and, and I did their thesis films and I did things and I went to um, you know, different film schools and that's how I got tape. Now, man, create your own tape, do it yourself. Because oh, my point was, you're all gonna wanna hire, you're creating all these incredible people that you're in school with right now, they're gonna move on. You're gonna move on. You're all gonna wanna work together. That's what it's all about. You're gonna be like, well, how did you guys, what happened? You guys are doing this show on the CW. You guys are doing this show at NBC together. Oh yeah, no, we went to SCAD together. I mean, it, it happens. That's, that's, this is where it starts, guys. So, um, you know, it, it, it's like you're forming your little troop, your little acting troop, your creative troop, your producing troop, whatever. And you don't forget the people that you come up with. Um, it happens all the time through theater groups, through, I mean, Scott will talk to that. I mean, it's like, it's, you know, everybody, you want to work with the people that you're in your theater group with or your theater company with. And it, it I'm going to hand it back. Way. I'm going to hand it off to Scott in a second. I have one one more question that I want to get to because I know the kids want to ask some questions and I shouldn't say kids. I know the students want to ask some questions. Um, uh, you, you, you make that. That's a really great uh, point that you made. And I think that, um, uh, you know, those, those are things that I think everybody should think about. One of the great things I think about SCAD is that is that it's a school that offers all of the disciplines. So from building the sets to creating the costumes to doing the graphic design to writing, producing, directing, editing, uh, acting, all of these disciplines are taught at that school and all of them come together in student projects. Uh, And as a matter of fact, one of the great things about SCAD, and I mentioned this just because I thought you'd be interested in this, Greg, is that they have a casting group at SCAD to cast films in that great area of filmmaking going on in Georgia right now. Uh, so there's lots of opportunity. SCAD is right in the center of all of that. My last question before we hand it off b- uh, back to Scott is you, you've, you've had tons of opportunities to do all sorts of different kinds of acting. Mm-hmm. And you, you are one of the, I, I think about the James Brown 1963 album where the guy starts off with the hardest working man in show business, man <laughs> that did Star Trek, Star Wars, uh, you know, Star is Born, Felicity, uh, yeah, yeah. Just, I don't the, say the no. This is huge. No, I don't say no a lot. You don't say no, but you also have created a, a role for yourself that is is not necessarily a lead actor role in all yeah. of these films. You you seem comfortable uh, being not the head guy. Now you've done that. There's certainly, I mean, look, I I looked at your your part in uh, in Heroes, and that that on the days that you were the hero, you were the lead guy. And so yeah. and that's yeah. the way that worked in an ensemble cast. But you've created this role for yourself that is primarily, correct me if I'm wrong, background. Yeah, I mean, well, not background, character. Not background, yeah. yeah. Character actor. I mean, look, I uh, we all love Seinfeld, right? Uh, you guys, I mean, if you're not a Seinfeld fan, get off this stream right now, get, get, it, get out of here. I don't even wanna know. Um, but no. Who's your favorite character on Seinfeld? It ain't Jerry Seinfeld, okay? It's the characters. It's people that have a unique voice. And um, Kramer bums into the room and he's like, whoa, whoa. It's like, shoot, dude. 
you know, and then you've got the Nebishi guy and you've got, you know, Elaine, she's so smart, but she's got, I love that. And, and I love, you know, not less is more, but man, do I love stealing a scene. I just did, it's, it's not out there yet, but um, I just worked with Billy Bob Thornton and they, I got a call and they were like, we want you to play this role. They talk about you a lot in the episode. You have three scenes, but two of them are with Billy Bob. And I'm like, yeah, I mean, I want to work with Billy Bob, right? So I went up there and this is on um, his Amazon show. Uh, oh God, it's a huge show. Uh, 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 that's the, uh, the the one where he plays the lawyer. Goliath. Yeah, Goliath. Goliath. Yeah, Goliath. yeah. fabulous. So I, Except I find... for episode three, by the way, that was pretty wacky. Yeah, <laughs> <Exactly>. <laughs> but I find myself standing on a pier at night with Billy Bob Thornton, long lens, so the camera's far away. It's a close up on me, but the city lights of San Francisco behind us. I'm standing there. It's a two shot. And I'm looking at him and I just go, I just want to make out with you right now. And he starts laughing <laughs> and I'm, and I'm totally messing with him. And I go, is this not the dream? And he goes, Greg, these are the moments that I just live for as an actor. And uh, we got to do a whole thing about his acting style, uh, which I could talk about if you want, because he's very unique, but um, I, I like, I stole that scene. And now I got a call a couple of weeks ago, Larry Trilling, uh, got, talk about wanting to work with you again. He's my one of my oldest friends. He he was showrunner, big showrunner, but he runs that show. He calls me up and he goes, "Greg, I got to tell you, man, your scenes are unbelievable." And I'm and it's just so great to hear that because another actor would go, "What two scenes in a in a one episode on a TV show?" Nah, I don't. I, I steal these moments. That's what a character actor does. You take it and you elevate it. You so. I did a, mo a show called Masters of Sex on uh, Showtime. And that, that was incredible, that, that experience. Like I go in, I'm supposed to be just one episode. I stole that thing and they wrote me an arc of eight or nine episodes on that show. It was a period thing all about Johnson and Johnson. And like, you know, it's a really great show. If you haven't seen Masters of Sex, it's incredible. But I played the, the pretzel king of St. Louis and I, you know, and I'm in wardrobe, my hair, skewed. I don't even look the same. People go, ah, I didn't know that was you. And to be able to hide inside a character, Paterno, if you haven't seen Paterno, I mean, like I'm wearing a fat suit. I am like, I, I look like Scott Paterno. I researched him, got to know him. I hide in that movie and I'm yet, yet it's, I'm Al Pacino's son. I, I'm, I'm go toe to toe with him. I'm in, trapped in a house with Al Pacino for three weeks, four weeks, like acting with some of the greatest act. And he, it was just like those moments, I love it. And like you said, I've, I've been number one on the call sheet. I prefer to be number five. I really do. It, it, it's a better schedule. Um, not a lot is on your shoulders. The bad news about that is if number one isn't so great or if the show doesn't work, you know, you, there are things as a number one you can do to change your show um, and try and influence it. But I've had those opportunities and I'll get them again. I'll create them myself, but I'd much rather be the guy that you go, oh, I love that guy. <laughs> you know, that's when somebody comes up to me and goes, man, you're just like my brother. You're just like my best friend. You're just somebody, you know, when, when, when people come up to me and they go, I know you, uh, we go to church together. And I'm like, no, nope, but that's the greatest compliment you can tell me. Yeah, I, you know, I think that one of the, one of the themes that seems to permeate a lot of what we've been talking about here is creating your own opportunities. Uh, it seems to me to be maybe um, uh, something that is overarching in terms of how you get from point A to point Z. Right. Right. That's absolutely true. And, and, and I don't want people to take this, you know, like if it's, a, if it's a great scene, but all I'm doing is I'm the bank teller in the scene and, and, I, and I, I, you know, have this great scene with whoever, Tom Hanks or something, and I do the, I do the moment and, and that's it. Like, I'm not saying I'm looking for opportunities to just steal that scene. This is my scene. No, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm just saying, just do something where it's unexpected. Take a longer pause than, like, just listen, be that guy, have something going on with you we don't all just show up and say lines in life. You know, we come to any situation. You go to the store knowing that you're feeding somebody, you got to pick up the consequences to everything we do. So there should be consequences to everything you say, everything you listen to, any way you react to another character in a scene. You have your own shit going on. Don't forget that, you know? It's, it's just really important. 
So um, you get to see Greg in all these great movies and great TV shows, but also find Greg uh, online and on a TV show, a game show that has just been renewed for, I don't know, 3,000 new ep more episodes uh, called <laughs> 25 Words or Less with Meredith Vieira, another good By friend the way, this of shows mine. You, this shows you how, what, what kind of a, um, a crazy year it's been. In one year, I went from an X-Wing pilot in Star Wars to a celebrity contestant on a game show. What's going on with 2020? I'm so glad that that's behind me. I'm not saying I don't love doing game shows, but that's not, you know, my forte. I have been acting. You're, you're very funny on and very good on those game shows, by very the way. I, 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 am, I, am, I am constantly amazed at, at that sort of uh, broad brush that you have in this industry. As I said earlier on, whether it's acting, writing, producing, directing, playing the drums, uh, podcasting, all of these great things um, uh, are things that, you know, the multi-talented Greg Grunberg. But, but I, I will say something uh, before we open it up to questions. I just want to say I'm, I, I am a recognizable face. I'm, a play, I'm at a place in my career that's very different from a lot of you that are watching this right now. There's a tremendous mystery to you that is not, I, don't, I have lost that mystery. People know who I am. They see me on social media and I, I wear my heart on my sleeve. They're, they're, I'm not that guy. You may be mysterious and you should be. I don't know who you are, right? Jordan, uh, Jordan Butler, right? Jordan, people don't know who you are. That is so valuable, dude. That is, you are the great mystery. Who's this Jordan Butler guy? I, I put you in a movie. I don't know if you're an actor. I'm assuming, are you an actor? No. Oh, okay. Well, guess what? You're an actor now, dude. Congratulations. Um, Thanks. Okay, but I'm just saying, let's say Jordan was an actor. If, if, if you're starting out, there's something so cool about discovery. Are you a writer? No. no. Director? No? Okay. No. Well, whenever you are. But 25 words or less. <laughs> that, that, that initial, for the actors out there, that initial like, Wow, who is that person? That discovery is so cool. Look at what JJ did with Carrie Russell and Jennifer Garner and um, Daisy Ridley and even on Lost. You know, he's got these, he finds these incredible actresses and, and he, he's so good at seeing something and going, okay, that's a future star. I want to develop it. That goes, with me, it's not, that doesn't exist anymore. So I have adapted, I'm hosting, you know, I have a, I did a Food Network show. I did, I came to Atlanta. I was in Gwinnett County and I did, uh, this whole thing for the NFL um, where we went to um, artificial turf factory and, and saw how they make artificial. I mean, like I love people. I love talking. I love hosting, but it's not for right now at the beginning of my career, keep, keep things close because you're a mystery and there's something really exciting about that. Later, you can open yourself up to a lot of other things. You should be able to write for yourself, direct all that. But still what I'm saying is like, you're, you're, I, Frank, you're complimenting me and I get it, but I'm, I just want people to know they don't have to be creating businesses and doing all these things focus. And, and, you know, again, when the business catches up to you, when somebody gives you that break, when you give yourself that break, man, it's going to explode. It's mm -hmm. going it's to work. Great, great advice, uh, Greg. Thank you very much. I'm really sorry, by the way, that I didn't get a chance to work with JJ when he was at factory made ventures. Cause I had uh, done some work with those guys ah. uh, when, when they got involved with uh, Robert Rodriguez on the, the original, group that put together uh, the El Rey Network. Scott Smith, thank yeah. you very much. Yeah, uh, please take it we over. get a couple of questions from students. Uh, Christian Wins asks you, Greg, um, do you find inspiration for your acting from your writing or vice versa? Wow, that's a great question. Um, I, I always get inspiration for my acting from the writing. So that that's, you know, yes, whether it's my writing or not. I mean, for, you know, this, this is my, this is my book. Um, Dream Jumper. Um, if you don't know what it is, it's a graphic novel and I've set it up as a TV series now. And, and um, so I do take inspiration from that, but I, I usually, I mean, I, I take inspiration from everywhere. I take inspiration from other actors, other performances, um, from, from bad acting. I mean, I'm certainly going to be inspired to not do what I just saw. Or if I'm watching a movie and I go, you know, somebody on here said, Dis uh, Disney acting, like you're, you're, you don't know what that means. So just so you know, like when you watch kids watch TV, my boys, when they were young, they watch TV. There's an, there's an unconditional um, critique that, that people, that young people have. And they watch something 
you know right away if something's false, man. Right away. My son will be like, oh, that was, he's a bad actor, right? Or daddy, she, he, she's not a very good actress. I'm like, why do you say that? I don't, I don't know. She just doesn't seem real. And I'm telling you right now, Disney, if you watch Disney shows, it's changing. I was on a show called Baby Daddy. And that was, that was on the Disney thing. And that was very real. And it was a sitcom and everything. But some of these shows that are so phony and blah, 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 that's not my style. And I just can't do it. And I, I just don't want to do it. I want to, I want to be as real as possible and as relatable as possible. So that's what I meant by um, the Disney acting. So I get influenced by, by a bunch of different, um, you know, a diff bunch of different places. But on set, my inspiration comes from, there's only one person that I'm trying to please. And that's the director. That's it. At that point, it's you and the director and a good director will know that if we call it a hat on a hat, if you're wearing a hat and it's like, Oh, that's a cool looking hat. And then you're like, Ooh, I need a reaction bigger than that. Now I'm going to put another hat on and another hat on. Don't put a hat on a hat on a hat. If you say a line on a set and it's, and you know, it's really good and it works. Now you're going to try and change it. Cause now I gotta, I gotta get the crew laughing. I gotta get, no, no, there's a camera. That's it, man. You, you say that line again. You might want to, pause or get a different reaction from the actor you're acting with but don't try to just please everyone and keep making it bigger and bigger and bigger that's 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 just not not right i i um i worked with james brooks and uh, uh yeah and, and jimmy burroughs and these guys and and on on uh sitcoms they are the king of, of real real acting even in a sitcom and you look at two and a half men and they they just come off of two and a half men and i had had this show and i i did my line and it's a live audience and then I'm now trying to get them to laugh again. And so I changed it a little bit, a little bit bigger, a little bit bigger, a little bit bigger. And uh, he comes up to me, uh, Jimmy, and comes up to me and he goes, I don't know why you're getting so loud. And I said, well, because this, he said, no, 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 you're mic'd. Who cares that they can hear you? It doesn't matter. You're nailing it. So go back to just being as real as possible. It's funny. It's funny. And it's true. Like you just have to trust in yourself. You found the way to do it. Now you'll find other moments to, to you know, to work out in the scene. But don't don't keep trying to you know change it and make it bigger than it needs to be. I, I want to follow up a little bit, uh, Scott, if you don't mind. Uh, sure. it, it, one of the things that you were talking about was was watching bad actors. Um, I, I found, and I and I want to know if there's a similar idea uh, uh, it, it, that that if I watch a bad guitar player, uh, that he does, he'll put two notes together in a way that I don't put together those notes that way. And I, I will have learned something from this bad guitar player. Does that also work in acting? Yeah, I mean, exactly. And, and, but you know, when I say bad, I mean, there's no, no one is overall, everything they're doing is awful, but there, there are just moments when you go as a, as a director now, especially I'll look at like, there was a, give an example. There was a, a guy who was a pretty good actor on Felicity but this is what he did. It was just his crutch. Everybody has a crutch that they, that, that you can see in their performance. They do it every single time, you know? Um, and, and some of them, it becomes their style. Other people, you know, this guy's was, he, he would say his line. He'd be like, you know, uh, um, I'm here. I'm here for the money. You said you were going to pay me. Well, well, then where's the money you owe us? He would look away every time between each line. And you're like, where's he looking? And I remember seeing it on set and going, what is he doing? Meanwhile, in the editing room, we, they cut him out, these moments out, and he was locked. And it was like, wow, he's such a good actor. He really was great. But this, he, somehow he saw his lines over here. So he hmm. this, and then he looked over and he saw, and there was nothing there. Um, I've worked with people that have planted their lines throughout the set, but he didn't have anything, but it's like that, you know, so I learn. you learn from, yeah, you learn from the good and from the bad and different styles and, and different people. But sometimes when you're working with someone, it's so hard because you just like, oh, just let me lead this dance. You know, it's a dance. Let me, let me, sh let me waltz us through this, you know, or, or I'm going to lead you just find, find a rhythm. Some people don't, you know, and you just have to adapt. I, I, again, I enjoy every step of the process. I enjoy the good, the bad, the ugly of it all. Um, it's, they're all stories to tell later, by the way. And don't hold anything super precious. If you're producing something, if you're writing, directing something, it's not gonna be the last thing you write or direct or produce. I know at the moment you wanna make it the greatest thing in the world, your performance as an actor, you're like, but you're always gonna get in the car after an audition 
and nail it in the car on the way home. <laughs> always, always, you're going to be like, and I have a friend of mine that he went and auditioned for a show called Cheers. If you don't know, one of the biggest shows ever. Mm-hmm. Went in, auditioned, didn't, did it, did it okay, whatever. Got in his car and drove. And, and as he's leaving the, the lot at Paramount, he went, oh man, I should have done this. And he goes, parked it, parked his car, drove back in, parked his car, told security, I left something in the office, parked his car, went back in and said, I want to do it again. And they were like, Alex, you just did it. And they said, the, the casting director was like, all right, look, and he said, please, please. And he goes, Alex, I'll let you back in this room. This is a great story for you actors. I will let you back in this room, but if you don't change what you just did, because it was good, I'm never calling you back in again. I can't put myself on the line. I'm telling them you're going to, he goes, no, trust me, it'll be fine. He goes back in. They, he waited and waited and waited, and they finally had a spot. spot. He goes back in. They're like, hey, everybody, it's Alex Neville again. And, and he goes back in. He ended up doing three years on Cheers. He got the role, and it, it was a one-time thing. He ended up three years, and it was just do whatever it takes, guys. Do whatever it takes. If you're if you're not going to change it up and you're going to alienate yourself, don't do that. But I'm saying go with your gut. Like if you, if, if you have passion and, 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 and it's like, no, I, oh, don't be afraid. Break the rules. Who cares? Who cares? Do whatever you need to do. Um, we've got a question from, I think it's um, Mattia Bryant. What's the hardest role you've ever played and why was it such a struggle? And there's another part to it as well, but I'll ask that up to you. Uh, well, okay. So I, I know my limitations. I know what I like to do and I don't like to do. And occasionally um, I'll get opportunities to play bad guys, like really bad people. And that's not expected. So it's kind of cool. You, you see me in a movie and you go, oh, I like that guy. Oh no, <laughs> he's the killer. Or you don't, you know, we want to have, I'm a red herring. So you don't know that I'm the killer or I'm, and there was this opportunity to, to, to do this movie. It was called The Dark Room. And and um, they wanted me to be the heavy in the, in the movie. It was me and, Lu- and Lucy Lawless. And it was, I, I was just this guy who loved to take women up to a cabin and, and, you know, abuse them and slit their throat and kill them. And it was just like, that's just not me. And I hated every minute of it. Mm-hmm. I didn't enjoy the process. I don't like living in that guy's head. I, you know, I'm not Al Pacino. I'm not, it's not like I was taking my work home with me. And my wife was like, what do you want for dinner? And I'm like, oh, those beans better taste delicious or you're going to get it. I didn't know. No. Uh, and why we were eating beans, I don't know. But anyway, no, she, uh, I, I just didn't enjoy. And it was a struggle every day because I was like, how do I make this interesting? How do I make this more me? Big Ass Spider. You mentioned this movie, Big Ass Spider, right? And this is now, now swinging the pendulum to one of my favorite things ever was this is a movie. It's a little movie. It's a cult movie, man. When they brought it to me, it was called Mega Spider. And I said, no, let's not take ourselves so seriously. Let's do something fun. So we called it Big Ass Spider. I came on and, and I starred in it. And I said, I want to produce it. And, and I had a little more control. It was collaborative the whole way. Greatest, greatest people. And it's a, at the end of the movie, you go, man, those two guys are hilarious. That was a great, fun movie. Oh, yeah. There was a giant spider in the movie. Like it, it just became more of a buddy cop kind of a movie. And it's just wonderful, like a great, great experience on a low budget thing. So, um, you know, I, I just, I enjoy levity. I enjoy humor. I enjoy really um, sinking my teeth into a character, working with great people, but I don't want to play a mass murderer anymore. I don't want to play those roles. I just, it's not for me. So that was the worst. Here's the other part of that question. It's a good one. I think a lot of actors have this, the young actors have this question. Uh, any struggle to be in the moment and get out of their heads? Uh, yeah, for sure. Um, one of the things that um, I find the hardest is when, um, when, when it's all about me, like personally, I, I just can't stand it. I, I love people always ask like, oh, can we come and visit the set? Can we be there and whatever? And I, now I feel responsibility to having people there. I want to come in and do my job and, blow people away, blow myself away, and then walk away. And I, I, you get in your own way when you've got other things going on, when you're not as prepared as possible, when, you know, it's just, if you do your homework enough, if you read the, read your sides, know the scene. Oh, and don't, and also don't freak out about, like if you're doing an episode of a TV show and you're guest starring or you're in on the series or whatever, if you look at that script, you go, how am I going to ever learn all these lines? You don't have to. When you do this in the real world, you know and I know, Scad, you guys do this. 
just like you do in the real world, you know, you have a day, you have a, you have two scenes, maybe. So learn those two scenes. And at the end of that day, you'll get the pages for the next day, which are going to change anyway. So don't freak out, like just be as prepared as possible for that day. And like JJ, he's directing Star Wars. We're hanging out in London. We're having the greatest time ever. And we're out till we're walking the streets of London. We're, and, I, and this happened night after night after night. I'm like, what are you doing? You're directing the biggest movie in the world tomorrow morning. Aren't you going to prepare? He's like, yeah, we'll figure it out tomorrow. When I get there. I mean, he's done a lot of prep work. Obviously he knows what he's shooting, but he's like, yeah. I mean, I, if you get in your head too much, at the end of the day, guys, we're not um, curing COVID. We're not brain surgeons we're not it's not life and death you are cast as this actor you are the writer you are you're gonna make it work you're gonna make it work you're surrounding yourself with great people it's not the end of the world um getting to the end of a script is the next to next to the hardest thing in the world and so if you've written a script congratulations these are milestones that, that you need to celebrate and know okay i did that now what's my next thing you know just take them one at a time and don't freak out. And, you know, um, it's a long train ride, man, long, <laughs> long train ride, this, this business that we're in. And um, just like a movie or the characters that you play, remember that if people are watching you, you know, there's, 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 there's this, this, uh, you know, consume or, or, or um, be this character, right? But you also have to have the ability to know what it looks like you doing this character how you sound, what you, you know, don't be deaf to that, you know, like be aware of what you look like and what you're, what you sound like. I'm not saying pose or anything. Don't worry about the camera, but just be aware of who you are because no matter how interesting the movie is, or no matter how long the movie is, you're not going to want to take this journey with the character you're playing unless you are great. And like, if I sit, if I'm taking a train in Europe from somewhere to somewhere, if the person next to me is interesting or a flight and I start talking to them, the flight goes by like that, man. It's so interesting. It's like, wow, did we, we spoke, we were talking for three hours. That was amazing. That's what a movie is. If that person or that character or that story is that interesting, it doesn't matter if it's long, doesn't matter the page count, whatever, just make it as interesting and as entertaining as possible. Mm -hmm. oh, great answer. Uh, Emily Rupert has a question. She says, I think the only question I have is, um, what inspires you to want to continue acting in front of the camera? And what are your plans right after this meeting? <laughs> right after this meeting? Are we getting coffee? Is that what you, <laughs> is somebody inviting me to coffee? Um, okay. Uh, wait, what was the first part of the question? What, what, in, what <laughs> inspires you to continue acting? Oh, 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 money. It's all about money. No, I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> um, what inspires me now is working with great people and making something, uh, honestly, it's like, I, I, I've been very fortunate. And so I'm at a point now where it's like, all right, I just wanna, I wanna enjoy every moment. I wanna be able to take advantage of great opportunities. And, and that's why I said, you know, I was joking with Frank, but I don't say no to anything. If somebody calls me, unless it's a terrible project, but if somebody calls me and goes, hey, I really, and it's by the way, it's all about the people. Like I'll, I'll get a call from somebody and they'll say, hey, I'm working on this thing. I was wondering if I interrupt them immediately, if I love them and it's somebody I've worked with before or somebody I want to work with, I interrupt them right away and I go, yes. Mm. And they're like, well, I haven't even told you about the character or what, I'm like, I don't care. Yes, I want to work with you. It's a long process before the cameras roll and they call action. We're going to have many discussions. I'm going to, I'm going to put my stamp on. I know I've had the experience in this already. So I, what, what gets me excited is working with great people. Um, what am I doing after this meeting? Um, I am, uh, I am uh, I, I, honestly, I'm getting on a Zoom with um, a great company to try and uh, help people that have epilepsy. My oldest son has epilepsy and I'm a spokesperson nationally for people with seizures and epilepsy. And so I'm doing that. Um, what am I doing creatively? Uh, I am working on a big documentary, huge documentary uh, uh, on one of the best baseball players to ever play the game. And so uh, I got to call him back and, and start setting up interviews and things. So, yeah, I just had so, I have so many projects that I have going. Yeah. Player, Greg. I want to. Uh, I can't. I'll tell in. you, Scott, I'll tell you offline. OK, OK. Yeah. Uh, well, and, and, and clearly, uh, probably something we're going to want to bring to the Savannah Film Festival for their documentaries. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, it, it's, it's worth talking about later. But I, I do want to uh, ask you a question about production during COVID. 
uh, right now. Tell, tell yeah. me a little bit about what you've experienced with production during COVID. I understand that Los Angeles has just about opened up all of its studios again, where over yeah. here, Pinewood and uh, here in, in the UK, everything's shut down. So what, what's going on now during COVID and how, how's that affecting production? So, um, okay, so in my little, I own, a, I own this like 6,000 square foot uh, soundstage shooting facility. My, it's my building, I shoot things there. We have a COVID officer, we have a, another compliance officer on set and we limit the crew to next to nobody. We'll set up the cameras and everything's ready. And then the crew pulls back. We roll the cameras, a lot of extra lead and, and but it's not film, so who cares? There's just so many things that you can do um, so that people are not all on, on top of each other. Um, and the you know, the, the regulations that have been set out um, are pretty good. The problem is that in our business, you know, we, we collaborate, there's a lot of people on set and time is money and people get careless. And so I personally have said no to some really good opportunities this year because I just didn't trust. First of all, I didn't want to travel. One was in Atlanta and they were like, yeah, you're going to get on a plane, you're going to land, go to the hotel, change, go to set, wardrobe. I'm like, where's my quarantine time? Like where, where? Oh, no, we're not doing that. We're not doing that. And I was like, nope. And that was a really cool, really cool thing. And I'm like, Ugh. and I talked to my agents about it and it's just not worth it. I mean, I'm, you know, I, I, I'm not, a, I don't have comorbidity or anything. I mean, I'm, I'm overweight and I just am so worried about getting this. I don't want to get it. I want my family to get it. My oldest son is epilepsy. Not that he's has seizures all the time. He's totally controlled, but I don't want him to get it. So I'm just so hyper aware. We did shoot some things at the building and uh, music's things and and you know I, I mean I'll even mention it it's fine he's out there about it Sammy Hagar from you know Van Halen Sammy gets out of the I'm waiting for him we're all ready he gets out of his car and he walks right past the nurse that's supposed to test him no mask walks right in and he's like all right let's do this come on man and I'm like no dude you gotta go test and he's like ah oh, come on dude nah this is all fake and I'm like oh dude and so that was a, something that I took a chance and I shouldn't have. That was really stupid, but we you know, got, we got what we needed mm -hmm. and I stayed, stayed as far away from him as I could. And, you know, I, 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 this makes me think a little bit about the Tom Cruise incident where he blew up on the, on his cast uh, and his crew. Yeah. Um, and it made me think, and, and it, this is something that I think you also were alluding to a number of times is that you are your own brand. You are the brand. Yeah. Uh, something happens to you, the brand dissolves. That That's not a good thing. I mean, if, for example, Tom Cruise, if something happened to Tom Cruise, that yeah. whole movie goes down the tubes. Yeah, but it, I've, I know Tom, I, we worked on, I did Mission Impossible with him. He, uh, I guarantee you, that was not the first time that he has had, a, that he's talked to the crew. And when he talked to them, Several times he was like, I'm putting my ass on the line here. I'm talking to the studio. We're doing it right, guys. I'm so proud of you. The only reason why we're in production and your friends have shut down and we were able to make a living is because we're doing it right. Then he got warned. Then he saw things he didn't. That was the culmination of a bunch of things. Right. And I stand by him. I mean, he that is so incredibly frustrating. And also, you know, people come and go on a set. He put, it's he had put up half a million dollars for people to stay on a boat. He, he'd done all this stuff. And you know, an extra extras come and go crew. Sometimes are day players. They come in. And so they don't have the same level of, of responsibility that someone who's responsible for the whole thing. So I think, I think that's where his frustration came yeah. from. But no, I felt, I thought, I thought that what he did was the right thing to do. I, I honestly yeah. think he, that, you know, there was a lot of consternation, a lot of, you know, pearl clutching with people who hadn't been there. I felt really that that was the, uh, that was a strongly. Yeah. It's tough though. I mean, it's he really was tough. good at it. Yeah. 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 Well, gentlemen, I, I, that's that's our time. Um, I want to thank Greg Grunberg, uh, Frank Radis so much for coming in today. Um, st uh, actors, students, thank you so much for being here. Uh, have a great rest of your weekend. Um, Greg and Frank, we can hang out afterwards a little bit and uh, we'll say goodbye to everybody else. Yeah, can I just, I just want to say uh, to everybody, um, I, I, I'm so excited for the position that you guys are in right now. You're, you're entering into the greatest business ever. And we've all heard the term, you know, if you love what you do, it's not work. And there's nothing about what we do that's work, nothing. Everything we do is so much fun. And for the writers out there, this is something that JJ has instilled in me. When I, when, like, when I had the idea for this, right? I said, I was like, oh my God. And I called my best friend. I'm like, JJ, I have a great idea for a movie. Let's see. And he goes, I don't want to hear it, write it. 
And I said, no, 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 I, I wanna tell you because maybe it's not, no, you're so excited about this. That excitement, that energy that you guys have right now for whatever idea you have in your head, whatever audition you're about to do, do it, do it. Don't sit, don't talk about it. Because as soon as you talk about it with somebody, then you get the reaction that you ultimately will get if you finish the project. So take that energy, that excitement, and let it carry you to finish that script, to produce that thing, to shoot that scene of yourself. Get it, do it. And if it sucks, then it's a learning curve. It's a learning and you move on, you learn from it and you do the next thing. Nothing should be precious, but, but again, don't talk, do. Because it, we are in, we're so lucky to be able to do what we're doing. Oh, that is the word right there. What a great way to end. Thank you so much, uh, Greg and Frank. Thank, Thank you. you for moderating. Um, Thanks. That's it for guessing Gusto's now. Bye, everybody.